Mikio is an ugly and lonely idiot who finds himself in a gaming world. Upon realizing that he can no longer return to his real world, he decides to live his best life by preparing a sexy slave harem for himself in an unending clapping festival. Before this happens, Mikio wakes up in a stable and wonders where he is. Then he realizes that this could be because of the weird online game he'd just been playing some time ago. After selecting something on his screen, the game had led him to this unknown game world. Realizing that he is now in a game world, he takes a look at his stats in this world, using the identity power he had also clicked in his earlier game selection. This reveals that he is just a level 1 villager. No different from the loser, he was in the real world. Fortunately, he sees a powerful sword called Durandal and the Ring of Determination that improves his offensive power. Fully aware that he is not as normal as he was in the real world, he springs out to kickstart a new adventure. When he steps out, he realizes just how peaceful this world is, making him pleased at how this game is starting out. Just then, he sees some of his fellow villagers trying to fight off some bandits. Using his identity powers, he notices that the bandit leader's bandana is powerful. With the fight continuing, the bandits outmatch the villagers, leaving him with no choice but to intervene. Just before one of the bandits kills a villager, Mikio takes his head as a souvenir. He does the same for another, causing the bandits to retreat in fear. However, Mikio's heart remained as hard as his lonely boner. He runs after them, swinging his sword like a samurai warrior, and harvesting their lives for pleasure. After that, the village chief comes to appreciate him for saving the village. To show his appreciation, he takes Michio to a store filled with the spoils of war from the defeat of the bandits, asking that he take all that he can as a reward. Immediately, Michio recognizes the bandit leader's bandana and realizes that although it looks similar, it isn't the same one he had seen earlier since this one has no skill. He informs the village chief that someone had shaped the bandana. Hearing this, he assures Michio that he would look into it. Later on, Michio gets taken to a room to rest. There he tries to log out of the game and return to the real world. Unfortunately, and after several tries, he comes to the realization that he is stuck here forever. It was at this moment that he knew he f***ed up. When this happens, the stupid idiot ignored the fact that he is trapped and is concerned about the bandits he had just sent to the underworld. He begins to feel bad about real people and not game characters like he thought. However, he comes to the conclusion that he was only answering the call of duty since the bandits were bad people. Shortly after, the old man returned with the wannabe ninja who swapped the bandana. After getting his hands on the real one, the old man asks Michio how he wishes to punish the thief. But he doesn't seem to give a f and asks the old man to handle it how they would normally do. Just then, the old man casts a spell, revealing the thief's intelligence card. Seeing this, Michio wonders what the heck is going on. In response, the oldie states that he is making it known that the thief is now a slave by putting the information on his intelligence card. Apparently, the punishment for theft in the village is slavery, whereby half the proceeds from the sale is given to the victim of the theft, which in this case is the clueless Mikio. Also, the oldie hands him the intelligence cards of the bandits he had just killed, informing him that there could be a price on some of them if he goes to the knight's station at Vale to redeem them. The following day, the old man takes Michio to Vale, where he redeems the bounties. While they head to where the slave would be sold, Michio is thrilled with how this world is and finds himself looking around. Seeing him, the oldie warns him not to do so, because there are so many areas which aren't safe. He informs Michio about a brothel in the area, and this causes the horny dummy's imagination to run wild. He begins to imagine the taste of large and succulent melons, coupled with the thought of clapping many Shortly after, they get to the mansion of the slave trader, Alan. He informs them about the labyrinth which had just opened up in the city. Upon hearing this, Mikio realizes that there is not much difference between this world and the real world. When Alan hears that Mikio fought off all the bandits in the village alone, he is surprised at how he was able to do so. However, Mikio states that it was a piece of cake, making Alan more suspicious. When the transaction is completed, the village chief hands Michio his own share and the two part ways. In this new world, Michio is left all alone, with no idea what to do. Not that he was much use in the real world either. While trying to figure this out, Alan comes out, asking that they chat some more. This time, he is taken to a very expensive room, where Alan brings up the suggestion that he should buy some slaves. This because Alan had figured that he was unadventurous, seeing as he defeated the bandits all alone. Upon hearing this suggestion, 
Mikio wonders if it is right to buy a new slave when he just sold one. To ease his guilt, Hallen reveals that his trading company deals more in selling female slaves that would give him easy access to premium plot development, something his loser privileges never offered him in the real world. This suggestion leaves lost in his freaky and sexy imagination of an unending harem. His thought is, however, cut short at the arrival of a maid named Roxanne, with massive jiggling balloons. She serves him some tea and a clear view of her melons to serve as desert. Feasting on this desert, Mikio tries to keep his cool, but his love for large melons gets the better of him. When Alan notices this, he seizes the opportunity to inform him that Roxanne is one of the slaves who could serve him in his quest for unending access to plot development. Also, he reveals that she is a wolfkin, which would make it impossible for her to get pregnant. That meant he wouldn't need to use protection when in the heat of battle. Furthermore, he states that she has no problems with letting him enjoy more than the deserts on her chest, as she has kept her virginity and the pleasure of this feast and her beautiful body for whoever becomes her master. Upon hearing all this, Mikio's mind runs wild, and he begins to consider the different possibilities to having a slave like her. Coupled with this, he can't imagine someone else being the master of a maid as beautiful and massively equipped as Roxanne. Immediately, he demands to know the price, ready to pay now. But unfortunately, the price for Roxanne is more than all the money he has made so far in the world combined. Michio comes to the realization that broke guys can't get laid, and decides to tap out of the deal. However, when the idiot sets sights on Ornellans again, he is dumbfounded. Seeing that Mikio likes what he sees, Alan offers to give him five days to get the money. Without wasting much time, Mikio agrees, determined to get it no matter what. But there seems to be the important matter of how he would get it since he has no idea how to make money in this world. Later that day, Mikio counts all his money, hoping he is the Elon Musk of this world, but realizes that he is a poor, ugly loser and is nowhere near being able to afford the pleasure of Roxanne's melons. While trying to figure out how to get the rest of the money, he remembers Alan talking about the existence of a labyrinth in this world where he could kill monsters to get some quick cash. Before heading to the labyrinth, he decides to reset his sword information to make it hidden from the eyes of everyone. After that, he heads out to the market to buy a normal sword. While approaching the labyrinth, Mikio sees some adventurers making use of teleportation magic to get there. He finds this intriguing but remains focused on his goal. Surprisingly to him, the labyrinth's entrance is a dark portal. Getting in, he realizes that he has now gotten the explorer's skill. This apparently allows him to use a dark portal to teleport himself with a dungeon walk spell. Unfortunately, he can only use this power to transport himself within the labyrinth. This causes him to realize that the adventurers he had seen earlier using this kind of power outside the labyrinth were using something different. Walking around, he sees a Needlewood monster and charges at it, killing it in one strike of his sword. Obviously, he used Durandal for this, and not the wannabe lightsaber he bought from the market. Just then, another Needlewood monster appears, and this time he uses one of his spells called Overwhelming to slow the monster down, allowing him to move faster. As a price for using this spell, he loses his strong will and finds himself being totally pessimistic. While trying to figure out why this is happening, he remembers he had felt the same way after using the dungeon walk spell earlier. Fortunately, he ends up regaining his strength due to Durandal's MP absorption quality. At this point, he decides not to use any more spells until he has more MP. After a hard day's work, Mikio realizes that if he keeps earning as little as he had earned that day from killing monsters, he would not be able to afford Roxanne after the five days given to him. As a solution, he decides that he would spend longer hours in the labyrinth to kill more monsters. The next day, Mikio wakes up as early as possible, only to discover that he now has a new skill which allows him to teleport himself anywhere, just like the adventurers he saw the day before. He immediately makes use of the skill to teleport himself straight into the labyrinth. As excited as he was by this new skill, he begins to feel very weak due to the massive amount of MP he lost. When this happens, he decides to make use of Durandal's MP absorption once more to strengthen himself back up by killing any monsters he could find. When he is done with this, he gets very tired and decides to take a rest. While doing so, he rests on the wall and ends up opening up a secret chamber in the labyrinth. Seeing the bright light coming from this chamber, the bastard assumes that this could be a hidden room filled with treasure. Hurriedly, he dives into the room but is disappointed to see that the bright light he saw was just a broken sword. 
Just before he could explore the possibilities of his new crib, he gets welcomed by his new roommates. A group of monsters come at him, ready to clap the asshole. At this point, he realizes that this room was actually the den of the monsters. With several monsters approaching him, he charges at them like a drunk samurai warrior. For the first time, the shithead gets knocked to the ground by the monsters, making him know that this fight is not as ordinary as he is. Being the shit that he was, he immediately tries to escape by using the dragon walk spell, but this doesn't work since he is currently in the middle of a fight. With not much option in his pathetic little brain, he activates the overwhelming spell, slowing the monsters down and giving him an advantage over them. Even though he is only able to kill a few of them at once, due to the limited time of the spell, he continues to use it regardless of how much it affects his MP negatively. He does this, hoping Durandal would absorb much MP to neutralize the effect. Fortunately, he is able to take down all the monsters and save his pathetic self from being killed by them. On his way back, he met some lovers like him who had felt it was so important to watch the lifeless body of a bandit who had been led to meet his maker. When he asks his fellow losers what happened, they inform him that the bandits who had attacked the village were made to leave after a dispute with a rival gang. Now they must have returned to the city to seek revenge. On hearing this, Mikio is shocked since he expects that they wouldn't be as stupid as him. He thinks they would normally be after him since he wiped most of them out. However, he realizes that the bandits would want revenge on those who made them leave town in the first place. In a brief moment, he wonders how the men were able to know that the lifeless man was a bandit, but soon discovers that his left hand has been cut off, making it easy for his life takers to get his intelligence card, which had refused to appear immediately after he was killed. The sight of this gives Michio a new idea. He realizes that it will take him a long time to get the cash he needs if he continues with the labyrinth adventure. He figures out that he had earned way more by killing the bandits earlier than he had by killing a lot of monsters. With this, he concludes that he needs an extra and more lucrative source of income. One which would involve hunting bandits and claiming the bounties on them. When Mikio gets back to his crib, he thinks of possible ways to face a lot of bandits at once. As much as he acknowledges the danger involved in this, his love for cats keeps him motivated. The following day, he heads out and begins his search for bandits using his identity skill. While looking around, he hears some dumbheads discussing the appearance of bandits in the slums, the very slums which the village chief had told him to avoid. Being the stupid idiot that he is, he decides to teleport himself there. On getting there, he finds some smelly villagers and no signs of bandits anywhere. Upon close observation, he figures they are being cautious since they aren't as stupid as him to consider walking around in broad daylight. Due to this, he decides to return at night, when he gets home, his smelly self realizes that he needs a bath. However, being the broke ass that he is, he can't afford an actual bath, so he uses a towel and water to clean his body. Furthermore, he realizes that he is no longer getting weak from using spells and figures it could be due to the MP he had gained from killing all those monsters in the monster's den. This makes him more confident that a bunch of bandits are no match for the great Shinobi that has become. Later that night, Mikio heads out, ready to harvest some bandit lives. Unfortunately, he can't find them as easily as he had thought he would. Shortly after, he heads to the red light district in the city and realizes that it is completely different from how it is during the day. This shocks into his rod literally as he sees a variety of sexy melons and freaky backsides. Since he only has eyes for Roxanne, he walks quickly past the district to avoid staring and eventually spending some money, which would reduce his chances of a lifelong harem even further. The idea of getting laid doesn't leave his head, and he is about to follow his dreams when he sees a bald-headed dummy come out of one of the buildings. Immediately, he identifies the baldy as a bandit and follows him secretly, hoping he would lead him to the bandit hideout. As expected, the bandit does so. While spying on the bandits, he overhears them talking about Hugo. This happens to be the name of the bandit leader he had sent headless to his ancestors in the village at the beginning. With this, he figures they could be part of the remaining bandits who had attacked the village. With no clear plan on what to do, he decides to head back to his crib. There, Kadu informs him about the power struggle between the bandits living in the slum and those in the town. With this information, he tries to figure out a way to get more information about the bandits from the bandits. I guess we can all agree that this guy's pretty dumb. In the midst of his thought, the honey bastard begins to fantasize about Roxanne's succulent melons and what he would do if he gets hold of them after buying her the next day. 
With one day left until the deadline given by Alan, Mikio gets set and heads to the slums. There he meets an ugly bandit, who he shows the thief bandana he had gotten in the beginning. He offers to sell it to the idiot in exchange for some information. Hurriedly, the bandit agrees and leads him to a room for a proper conversation. Then he requests to take a closer look at the bandana to be sure it is the real thing. However, when Mikio brings it out, he immediately charges at him, but the great shinobi dodges his attack. At that moment, the dummy brings out a disgusting weapon and threatens to kill Mikio if he doesn't hand over the bandana. Surprisingly, Mikio throws the bandana into the fire, causing the bandit to ignore him as he is more concerned about the bandana. This allows him to give the bandit a one-way ticket to the underworld. After that, he takes the bandit's hand as a souvenir. Since he had already begun the harvest of lives, he goes on to harvest the lives of all the bandits he could find in the rooms. Also, taking their hands as souvenirs. When he notices that other bandits have noticed his presence, he flees immediately using his teleport spell, leading him straight into the labyrinth. While taking a look at their intelligence card, he feels guilty for harvesting their lives but consoles himself with the fact that this is a world without laws and human rights to protect anyone. Getting the cards is one thing, but exchanging them for the bounty seemed to be another challenge for Mikio. He worries about the fact that he had just exchanged some intelligence cards days ago, which could cause the knights to be suspicious of him. He considers the idea of going to exchange them in a different town, but figures they could ask why he killed the bandits and seek to know why he didn't take the cards to the knights in his town. While thinking about this, he sleeps off with the assurance that getting Roxanne is now more of a reality than ever. The next day, he heads to the knight's station and finds the knight he had met on his last visit with the village chief. Without wasting much time, he shows him the intelligence cards and lies about being attacked by the bandits, which had caused him to kill them. Surprisingly, the knight asks no further questions and takes them into the building to examine them. Shortly after, he returns a pouch of money which he hands over to Michio. When Mikio takes a look at how much he made, he realizes that this is way more than what he needs to purchase Roxanne. Finally, his dream of getting laid is closer than ever. He immediately heads to the trading house to meet Alan and offers him the money for Roxanne. Seeing how he was able to pull this off, Alan commends him and brings Roxanne to him. When Roxanne sees her new master, she apologizes for not believing that he could pull this off. Then the two establish a contract, making Michio her new owner. Upon sealing the deal, he takes Roxanne with him to his crib, one of the larger bed than before, enough to make room for his intended plot development. When the two are alone in the room, he sees that she is nervous and believes that she is scared. To ease her mind, he asks to touch her ears. Doing this causes his tiny tool to be hard. Since he didn't want to rush things, he begins to tell her about where he came from, demanding that she teaches him how things are done here. Also, he promises to take her with him to the labyrinth and she is pleased to hear this, since she is convinced that she can be very useful to him in battle. Shortly after, she starts to unpack her bag and Michio sees that she is barefooted. When he asks her about this, she replies that she had never worn footwear and had been barefooted throughout their journey to his crib. Since he felt guilty about not noticing this, he gives her to sandals. While he wonders if her legs will fit, she makes use of a spell that adjusts the size of the sandals to suit her legs perfectly. Just then, she turns around and Michio whose tool needed sharpening, seizes the opportunity to hug her from behind, promising to never let her go. <laughs> Later that day, they head to the market to purchase some clothes for Roxanne and some equipment to aid their fights. When they arrive at the store for clothes, Mikio lets Roxanne take as much time as she needs to make her selection to clothe her insane body. When he hints about the planned showdown that night, she states that she would like to get some undergarments. Hearing this causes Michio's mind to run wild, but he calms himself and tells her to get to. When the two return from shopping, Mikio asks Roxanne to sit on the bed with him, but she immediately sits on the ground, as much as she never imagined that it was possible for a slave to sit on the bed of her master. Mikio insists that she sits beside him. Then he pulls her closer, asking that they sleep together on the bed. Hearing this, she is nervous and decides to arrange the equipment they had bought. In the midst of this awkwardness, the receptionist arrives with the water for their baths. Immediately, Mikio sees the perfect technique to carry out his clapping mission. He asks that she scrubs his back and offers to return the favor. The scrubbing of her backside eventually takes him to the moment he had been waiting for. He doesn't hesitate to grab her melons after scrubbing it briefly. 
After a moment of feeling the soft balloons, she goes on to wash his hair. This time, he gets a once-in-a-lifetime ache view of her dangling gorgeous cannons. Seeing them up close, he can't control himself and tries to hold her close to him. But she moves away from him, wanting to put on her maid clothes since she believed he would be pleased with her wearing it. This causes him to wonder what Alan had taught her. Nonetheless, he instructs her to put the clothes aside and take off the one last piece of clothing she has on. When she does this, he believes she is ready to get some of his magnum juice. Just as he imagined, he gets the chance to explore her freaky ways and fulfills his dream of getting laid and clapping with a total 10. Before sleeping, he instructs her to make sure to exchange some saliva with him before they sleep and when they wake up. The next morning, she follows his instructions and wakes him up with some passionate saliva juice. While they get ready to leave for the day's adventure, Mikio asks Roxanne how he can add skills to the equipment he bought, and she informs him about skill crystals, which can be formed by the accumulation of monster kills. However, the skills in these crystals can only be crafted into equipment by dwarves, who hold a PhD in blacksmithing. With this new information, Mikio considers hiring a dwarf, but she advises him against this because the process is never successful especially since the dwarves do not necessarily deal directly with individuals. Since he has a dwarf level of understanding, he insists on hiring a dwarf eventually. Meanwhile, since they would be heading out to fight monsters, Mikio hands Roxanne a leather armor. When she puts it on, he realizes that it was revealing the curves of her facilities. Since this view is exclusively for him, he charges it into a jacket. Shortly after they head out, Mikio leads her to a street corner. While she wonders where they are going, he makes use of his teleportation skill to transport them directly into the labyrinth. This leaves her shocked as to what sort of sorcery this is. She had imagined that this skill could only be used within the labyrinth, but he lets her know that this isn't the dungeon walk she knows, but is instead a teleportation skill. Then he instructs her not to tell anyone about it. After that, the two walk further into the labyrinth, and while there is no monster in sight, Roxanne uses her unique smelling abilities to sniff out the monsters. Before they head to battle, she asks him for a magic crystal, which he seems to know nothing about. Seeing how clueless he is, she explains that the magic crystals are used to accumulate the magic powder let out after the monsters are defeated. These magic crystals, she says, could eventually be used as energy sources for guild temples. After hearing this, he realizes how much of a stupid asshole he has been. He immediately seeks to know if they are very expensive, and she lets him know that they are the most valuable items in a labyrinth. While he soaks about how much money he has lost from his battle with the monsters, she calms him down by revealing that he hasn't necessarily missed out a lot since the magic crystals can only store tiny amounts of magic powder at a time. Not wanting to miss out anymore, he seeks to know how he can acquire a magic crystal, and she informs him that it can be gotten from the labyrinth or bought from the guild which sells empty crystals to adventurers. Hearing this, he decides to get one later. The two proceed even further and soon encounter a monster. Immediately, Mikio summons Durandal and being a total show-off, he takes down the monster in one strike to Roxanne's amusement. When they get back to their crib, Roxanne couldn't stop commending her master's skill, but he gives her credit for sniffing out the monster. Ready for the spin-off of their plot development, he asks her to sit beside him and make sure to do so everything they return from the labyrinth. Then he asks to play with her ears, which clearly turns her light bulb on. While stroking it, he is reminded of a meal he loved to eat in the real world. When he asks her about it, she doesn't seem familiar with it, but provides him with a likely alternative. Just then, she asks him if he will ever be returning to the real world. But being the perverted simp that he is, he says he is never going back. She had asked this question because it is common for masters to let go of their slaves in this world, but he assures her that he is never going to leave her. Where would he get easily accessible melons like hers to feast on if he does so? However, he reveals that he is considering expanding their party to make them more powerful, which she consents to. This makes him excited, as he believes she has just consented to his twisted idea of a harem. Later on, they go to get some empty magic crystals, and end up getting the black one which meant it was empty. Roxanne tells Mikio that the magic crystal changes its color, depending on the amount of magic powder stored inside it. Furthermore, she lets him know that after defeating 10 monsters, they turn red, purple after defeating 100, and green after defeating 10,000 monsters. On hearing this, Mikio gets eager to kill some monsters. The two end up defeating a couple of monsters, and since it was getting easier for them to defeat the monsters on the first floor, 
Roxanne suggests they go to the second floor. Since he would be upping his game, he decides to figure out a way to attack multiple monsters at once. Meanwhile, the two head to the second floor, and he realizes that the monsters here attack as a duo. He tries using spells to defeat them, but soon realizes that his MP is not enough for it. Therefore, he goes old school and uses Durandal to finish them off. When he is done, his crystal immediately turns red, meaning he had just taken down 10 monsters. At that moment, he notices that he now has a bonus skill, which multiples his monster kills by 32, speeding up his crystallization upgrade. Upon killing a few more monsters, his crystal turns purple, shocking Roxanne to the bones, especially since he hasn't killed up to 100 monsters yet. Once again, he tells her not to tell anyone about it. Just then, the two join hands to fight off the monsters and Michio gets shocked to see how good Roxanne is in combat. Coupled with his fighting skills, he considers having the healing skill too. Roxanne tells him that this skill is specially for the monks and can only be obtained after hand-to-hand -hand combat with a monster. At first, he tries it out by reducing the power of his sword, but the monster remains standing, leaving Roxanne with the perfect opportunity to finish it off. This gives her monk skill, wanting it for himself too. He decides to fight the next monster and ends up sending him on a journey to the underworld with his finishing punch. This activates the monk's skill which he uses to heal himself. The following day, the two find themselves in a deserted room in the labyrinth, which Roxanne refers to as the waiting room. A room which leads to the crib of the first floor boss. Apparently, they would have to defeat the first floor boss to gain access to the second floor. Furthermore, she tells him that only one party can do battle with the first floor boss at a time making it impossible for the door to be open for more than one party. Therefore, each party wanting to do battle with him must wait their turn. Since they are the only ones in the waiting room currently, they qualify to go up against the floor boss. Due to this, Roxanne seeks to know if her master is ready. Although he seems nervous, she is confident in his abilities. When the door finally opens, Roxanne tells him that they might be lucky to find some equipment belonging to previous adventurers who were wiped out but the boss. You gotta be kidding me. As much as this should have clearly been a sign for them to retreat, they prepare themselves to take on the first floor boss. All of a sudden, it appears, looking like a skinny ogre. Without much thought, Roxanne charges at it, but her attacks do not affect it in any way. Seeing that she is struggling, Mikio swings into action like a 21st century gentleman, and tries to save the day. However, his attacks are met by absolute nothingness. Fortunately, and after several tries, he is able to split the monster's body in two. In the midst of this victory, Muchio is left wondering how Roxanne is able to dodge the monster's attacks so easily. He attributes this to the fact that she is a beast warrior. While he wastes his time trying to be a low-budget Sherlock Holmes, Roxanne picks up a leave left behind by the floor boss. This gives her the herbalist ability which allows her to make medicines. Since they have successfully defeated the first floor boss, they now gain access to the second floor. When they get there, he realizes that there is not much difference, other than the fact that all the monsters in the second floor perform as a do, as opposed to the solo acts on the first floor. Since he also wanted the herbalist ability, he asks that they return to the waiting room and fight the first floor boss again. Immediately, he tries to make use of his portal to get to the first floor, but it takes him outside the labyrinth. This makes him embarrassed since he assumes Roxanne might think he doesn't know what he is doing. Being an eminence of wisdom, he lies that he was only experimenting with the portal and blinded by love. Roxanne believes him. The two head to the first floor boss room and take him in. This time, it felt like the boss had learned his lesson and gave them much of a fight. In the heat of battle, the monster tries to cast a spell, which Mikio stops. But this comes at the expense of a slap. The monster is about to spank him some more when Roxanne stops it. This gives Mikio the perfect cover to launch an attack and send the monster boss to the death of Hades. After defeating the monster once again, Mikio picks up the leaf this time and uses it to make some medicines. Surprisingly, the drugs he makes are antidote pills. This causes him to realize that some monsters use poison attacks in battle. Later on, they head to the store to purchase some medicines. After that, they head back to the second floor of the labyrinth. There, they encounter a level 2 Needlewood monster and a level 2 Green Caterpillar. Since he was more familiar with the Needlewood monster, Mikio goes up against it, leaving the Caterpillar to Roxanne. However, while he takes down his in one strike, Roxanne seems to be up against a tiny samurai warrior. However, its skill was no match for Mikio's swift strike. 
Since he has been curious, Mikio asks Roxane if the monsters are appearing in pairs, because they are on the second floor. She confirms this, stating that they will begin to appear in groups of three from the fourth floor and groups of four from the eighth floor. While they proceed deep into the second floor, they are met by two green caterpillars. Once again, Michio, being the top G, takes down his own in one strike. Meanwhile, Roxanne struggles to get hold of hers. Just then, the green ball casts a spell and spits out some white sticky thread, which wraps Michio up. Then, it springs up to attack him, but he shields himself with his legs and finds a way to swing his sword to kill the dumb ball. After being done for the day, the two head back to their crib. On their way, he figures the labyrinth could be getting more dangerous for them. This causes him to consider the idea of trying out a different and less dangerous labyrinth. One in a different city. While wondering about this, he immediately sights someone strange and pushes Roxanne to the wall as a diversion. Then he uses his identity skill to find out that the man is a bandit who is now staring keenly at Alan's house. Due to this, the two visit Roxanne's old master to inform him about his stalker. Alan, however, doesn't seem too bothered about this and assures them that he would handle it. But when he hears that his stalker is a bandit, he gets more concerned. While Alan wonders how Mikio knew the man was a bandit, he, not wanting to reveal his identity skill, tells him that he learned some things about them while trying to raise the money to buy Roxanne. Shockingly, Alan buys this lie. He tells Mikio that this stalking is related to the village thief he had sold to him some days ago. Apparently, the slave has been sold to a man who seemed overly concerned about the thief's bandana. Hearing this, Mikio realizes that the slave must have had a connection with the bandits beforehand. He inquires about the slave, and is told that he is allowed to move freely in and out of the mansion since he has been bought. This meant that the case could sneak out at night and open the door for the bandits. As much as this worries Mikio, Alan seems so chill about it, and assures him that he's got everything under control. Just as they are about to leave the building, Roxanne begs her master to help her by saving the granny who always took care of her while she was in Alan's household. Since he couldn't stand seeing Roxanne worried, he offers to be hired as a bodyguard, an offer which Alan finds surprising but accepts anyway. Before Mikio resumes his duty as a bodyguard, Roxanne charges him up for the task ahead by refreshing his Magnus in plot development. The next morning, the two get set and head out to await the intruders. Before then, Alan introduces them to his group of ugly combat slaves. Then, they put the lantern off, ready to unleash horror on anyone who sets foot in the building.